Um, our final talk for the day um, will be from uh, Dr. Herb Wang. Um, Herb Wang is a professor emeritus in geomechanics at the University of Madison, Wisconsin. He got his PhD in geophysics from MIT and a physics and is, uh, uh, sorry, a BS in physics from Harvard and a BA in physics from the University of Wisconsin. Dr. Wang's uh, research spans a wide range of geomechanics and multi-phase fluid flow. He has extensive experience in large-scale field and underground observatories, including the Sanford Underground Research Facility in the Black Hills of South Dakota. Herb is also the principal investigator for the NSF Research Coordinating Network on DAS uh, from the National Science Foundation. And, and Herb has really been one of the leaders. He is the leader of this team. Um, he's brought us all together in a tremendous way. And it's, it's just been a pleasure working with him as one of the team members. Herb was an early pioneer, very early pioneer. In fact, I remember being out in the field with him, banging rocks together in a riverbank someplace in Oregon, looking using a, a DAS instrument. It seems like a long, long time ago. Uh, he's a very strong proponent of the use of DAS for discovery in the earth sciences. So Herb, uh, Herb welcome. Herb will be presenting on DAS field trials for near surface geotechnical properties, earthquake seismology, and mine monitoring. The show is yours, Herb. <laughs> Thank you, Scott. Indeed, uh, what I'm going to do today is uh, tell you about a few field trials that represents uh, my odyssey uh, through DAS since my first experience with Scott in that uh, Kalapua River. And that was back in around uh, December of 2011. Uh, Dante Frata has been on this journey every step of the way, as have postdocs and graduate students. Uh, Selixa has uh, been a research partner uh, since our very early trials. So the very first trial uh, was on Lake Mendota. Uh, Michael Mondanos from Selixa had agreed to give us a demonstration of DAS, and my thought was as long as he was shipping the unit instead of uh, the standard demo, why don't we actually do an experiment? Uh, and then we gradually increased the size of our trials uh, to Garner Valley, which was uh, 762 meters, uh, Brady Hot Springs, which uh, will be used as an example in the tutorials, uh, was nearly nine kilometers. And uh, then if there's time, I'll close with a 250 meter array uh, in an underground mine just to uh, look at the capabilities for doing mine monitoring. I'm going to start again very briefly with the DAS principles and I know there have been a number of questions that have come up but the key um, parameters are this gauge length which equates to the spatial resolution of DAS and the uh, schematic diagram that I've used comes from a PhD thesis by Baku at MIT, in which you have two pulses that either go out a millisecond apart or are spaced uh, with, uh, at a single time. Uh, and you look at the backscatter Rayleigh reflections. And my picture of it, it you know, we're going to have to get some photonic engineers or uh, DAS. Uh, developers to help us with the, the details. But my picture is that you have these randomly oriented defects all along the fiber optic cable. And when you look at the backscattered uh, Rayleigh waves, uh, every segment of cable essentially is like a fingerprint of defects. And so if I look at all the backscattered uh, light from defects in a 10 meter uh, segment of the cable, then if I try to cross correlate those two uh, received pulses, then the difference in phase represents the uh, amount of strain, amount of length change in that segment of cable. And the, the phase change occurs for two reasons. The length of the cable in that 10 meter segment has physically changed. But in addition, the strain induces a, a change in the refractive index of the cable. That turns out to be something like 150 effect of the actual length change. 
Uh, but you have to account for both of them if you want to try to calibrate that phase change directly into a strain uh, change between the two pulses. Uh, so the typical uh, values that are used by Selixa is a 10 meter gauge length. And uh, because they send two pulses out uh, spaced by a millisecond in time, uh, one gets a measure through the phase of the strain rate. And then the third characteristic that is quite important is that the strain rate is measured in the direction of the cable. So uh, Michael Mondanos, who comes from a warm island in Greece, landed in Madison in early March, and we put him on the ice. Uh, and what we did was we laid out uh, 90 meters of cable uh, along the ice, and we had two different kinds of cable. So we went around the, we had three loops of cable that were co-located at a given point. And Dante Frata set out uh, geophones every five meters along the path. So we're very interested in how the DAS recordings compare with the geophone recordings. And we used uh, hammer seismic. Uh, and if you look at all the uh, loops of cable, this is time going uh, into the plane. And you see the first arrivals coming in and out, depending on where the source was and whether we're coming closer to the source or whether we're moving away from it in terms of this move out uh, along the cable length. So uh, that was our first uh, attempt. And I'm showing some photographs from being in the field for those of you who uh, are interested in the potential of this just to see what's involved. Ice turns out to be very easy to couple the cable uh, because on Friday afternoon, we laid the cable out. It snowed an inch or two. And by Monday, that cable had frozen uh, into the ice and we had pretty good coupling. So it made me think about my geology one lecture about how wild snow turns to firm the glacial ice. It's not a millennial process that took place in a weekend. So this is the cryosphere example. Then we wanted to do something a bit longer. And by the way, we did that in a triangular shape uh, in order to try to account for this directional sensitivity because DAS is measuring strain and strain is a second rank tensor unlike particle velocity, which is a, a, a vector. And so the angular variation goes as the cosine squared instead of as the cosine. So uh, in our next uh, uh, field layout, which took place in uh, Southern California near Palm Springs, uh, we were at a site that the uh, engineers uh, used to look at how building structures uh, were uh, affected by uh, the foundation. And so they had set up these one story uh, mock um, buildings and they uh, installed uh, counter rotating uh, motors on top of them. In the DAS world, these are called suborbital vibrators, and they would set the structures to uh, vibrating. And we could do this uh, with a swept frequency signal, and it uh, essentially was a vibrator with a very uh, large amplitude. And we had Pascal uh, geophones that were along various segments of the cable. At the most distal location on the cable, uh, we cement, uh, spliced the two together, so every single point along the cable was uh, duplicated. The, here's just some uh, shots of how we coupled the cable into the ground, a ditch which uh, dug a trench a few inches deep, the cable was laid in it, and then it was backfilled. Here are some of the uh, geophones being laid out uh, along the cable line. And this is the uh, structure that had these uh, uh, counter rotating uh, motors that produced the rocking motion of what the uh, civil engineers called their mini me structure. Uh, Lati in her talk described doing the hammer testing 
uh, for co-locating the cable with known points where you could do a GPS location. And uh, the green dots were where we did the so-called tap testing. Fiber optic cable is usually overstuffed by a couple of percent, meaning there's a little extra fiber relative to the um, jacket length. And so uh, over time, you need to interpolate between where you've located the, uh, the cable, but it's the glass that is actually uh, being measured in terms of the distance uh, from the uh, laser pulse uh, going out from the interrogator. So uh, that's a very important and necessary part of being able to uh, spatially reference where each DAS channel that is recording the uh, seismic waves is coming from. So at this test in Garner Valley, uh, there were a civil engineer with us and he was very skeptical about the uh, use of fiber optic cable uh, as measuring ground vibrations until he saw the screenshot in which uh, you can see time uh, moving along the vertical axis and different channels uh, converted to distance going away from the uh, interrogator. And again, the move out goes uh, out and back depending on the distance that the particular segment of fiber is relative to the interrogator. So it's going out and back and out. And then uh, this is where the splice is at the most distal point from the interrogator. And that represents a point of symmetry. We used um, a four fiber cable, two of which were single mode to carry the DAS signal. And then there were two additional um, fibers that could be used for distributed temperature sensing. And that can be very useful uh, if you're trying to uh, look at a fluid flow field because there could be information in the temperature distribution uh, as well as in the uh, ground motion. Uh, our signals, this is the uh, uh, Minimi structure source. Uh, it was sweat frequency from about half a hertz up to 10 hertz over 30 seconds. And then we came back down in frequency. Uh, and then at the end of a minute, that constituted a test. So uh, the, here's the recording from a four and a half uh, hertz geophones vertical component. And uh, we saw some traffic along the nearby highway. This is the DAS strain rate recording, and uh, all the same events showed up, but you can see there are some different characteristics in the signal. Uh, because the civil engineers uh, before us had done uh, multi-channel analysis of surface waves to look at the shear wave structure beneath the site, uh, we used the sweat frequency source uh, and put them in two hertz spins to obtain a surface wave dispersion profile. And uh, this is just an example of seeing the move out in a two hertz bin. And we saw frequencies between uh, a, a couple of hertz and maybe 30 or 40 hertz if you included the harmonics from uh, that shear shaker. We also used um, ambient noise. This was Zhang Fong Zhang. And, uh, the noise correlation functions, he would stack and then find uh, a dispersion curve based on where the maximum energy was in a frequency velocity diagram and the dispersion curve that he obtained uh, using MASW from these noise correlation functions fit very well between about 5 and 10 hertz on the uh, dispersion curve that was obtained using that uh, shaker. And so the, the ambient noise was recorded uh, for about eight hours overnight and then no longer requires having an active source to getting near surface structure. And so in terms of uh, Richard Allen's talk about uh, you know, how will the ground motion vary uh, at specific sites uh, where an earthquake uh, vibration is significant, uh, the, the, there are various rules of thumb, like the average shear wave velocity in the top 30 meters 
And so ambient noise uh, could possibly be used to do that on a block by block basis in an urban area. Because uh, California Highway 74 ran right by our field site, uh, if we looked at the nearest point of first arrival, we could just follow cars that moved along uh, the highway. And uh, this is your radar trap without radar. Uh, monitoring traffic is something that Nate Lindsay has done recently in which he's followed the traffic along uh, Sand Hill Road just beside the Stanford campus and looked at, the, no, he could count the number of cars and saw how the activity uh, uh, changed as a result of the stay uh, in place uh, requirements during the COVID epidemic. And that was uh, something he presented uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, on a webinar and that was very, uh, very interesting use of using DAS and in his case, uh, dark fiber uh, along the road. Okay, so now let me turn to our nine kilometer array at Brady Hot Springs. This is the example that uh, Eileen Martin will be using in the tutorial. Uh, in this case, we're in a geothermal field that is operated by ORMAT. Uh, Kurt Feigl was the principal investigator in uh, over a 21 day period of continuous uh, DAS recording. Uh, there were various changes in the pumping schedule of the injection and production wells so that there were changes that were presumably taking place in the reservoir. So the DAS array uh, on the surface is shown here. It's about 1,500 meters uh, uh, going from uh, southwest to northeast. And this is Interstate 80, about 40 miles northeast of Reno and about 400 meters in width. We use this herringbone or zigzag pattern again to try to deal with the directional sensitivity of DAS, uh, but it really turns out that there, uh, there were two principal directions if you plot all of these segments in a rose diagram. And if you're looking at uh, ray processing for say beam forming, essentially there are two arms to this array, one running in this direction and then one running uh, in, in that crosswise direction. And the individual zigzags, however, could be used to map variations in the near surface structure as uh, a fence diagram along uh, these paths. So again, some field shots. We had a, a very large uh, vibrosized truck called T-Rex and uh, th there's a huge amount of data, 44 terabytes of data. This truck moved around on a 50 meter grid, uh, sounding in several different polarizations uh, at every location repeatedly over that 21 day interval. In addition, there were 238 nodal seismometers uh, set also in an approximately 50 meter grid. Uh, it, in retrospect, uh, it might have been useful if we had more purposely spaced nodals along some of these DAS segments for the purpose of comparing them. Uh, so I'm going to just focus on the analysis that we did for both the DAS and geophone arrivals from a magnitude 4.3 earthquake that occurred about 150 kilometers south southwest of our site. The, the, during, uh, during this continuous recording. Uh, here you see in the red, the uh, nodal seismometer recording in a direction that is uh, in line after you rotate the components with the DAS cable, which is shown in blue. So in the paper that we have in uh, uh, journal, uh, Geophys Geophysical Journal International, I, I, we show the different spectral responses, we show the different signal to noise ratio, and in general you can see that the signal to noise ratio of the geophones is somewhat better than DAS. Uh, and, but maybe at lower frequencies, at, at around one hertz, the uh, DAS uh, starts to match up uh, pretty well with the geophones. I was particularly interested in how the uh, 
dance recording compares with the geophone recordings in a calibrated way. And so there are two relationships that one can use to do that comparison. So one uh, is that the, the, the DAS channels along a cable segment that has geophones at the end, uh, I'll show a finite difference relationship between the sum of the DAS channels and the line segment ending geophones. And then there's a second relationship that relates the strain uh, to the, uh, as being proportional to the, the particle velocity where the proportionality constant is the slowness. So I'm, uh, the finite difference relationship for two geophones uses the uh, fact that the DAS strain rate is uh, an average over the gauge length. And if you just do that integration, assuming a constant strain rate over that uh, 10 meter uh, interval is the finite difference of the geophone particle velocity on either side uh, a half a gauge length away from the DAS channel. So that's pictured here that if I have a geophone uh, in the center between two uh, seismometers, then I simply take their difference and divide by the gauge length, how well do they compare? Uh, if you sum up over a longer uh, span, like uh, 50 or 60 meters, then every 10 meters is the gauge length, and we took the DAS channels, added them up, and that also is equal to the difference of the end member um, geophones. So here uh, is shown the uh, earthquake recording by the um, DAS and by the geophones uh, in which the calibrations and the instrument response of the geophone was taken into account and the units that are plotted, nano strain per second, is an absolute uh, unit. A blow up of the uh, arrival shows that there was, for the first few cycles, a pretty good match between the sum of the geophones, uh, the, sorry, the sum of the DAS channels and the difference of the two uh, end geophones. And I had said, you know, if these line up, this would be a minor miracle. And the fact that it does, I think, is really fortuitous. Uh, because when one considers the type of ground coupling uh, along the uh, trench and the uh, point coupling of the geophones, it just really seems like a stretch to imagine that you're going to get this wiggle for wiggle match. But we gave you examples uh, where it did. Uh, the second relationship uh, is one that was first published by Daly et al of how one can convert DAS to being a virtual geophone. And so if you have a uh, strain sensor and um, a seismometer that are co-located, way back in the 1930s, Benioff uh, showed that for a plane wave, the relationship between the strain and the particle velocity in the direction in which strain is measured gives you a measure of the slowness or the reciprocal, the phase velocity. So that uh, at Caltech, there was both the strain meter and uh, a seismometer. And so in theory, you didn't need to have multiple uh, seismic uh, seismometers to measure the uh, phase velocity between them. But at a single station, you could estimate what that phase velocity was. And uh, Mukomo and uh, Keaki, in 1964 have a paper in which they made a test of this. Well, because we had the geophones and we had the, the, the DAS strain, if you integrate it, uh, we could test to see how well that ratio of strain to particle velocity lined up. And so the graph here shows uh, that 
the apparent velocity based on the, the move out between the DAS channels uh, would have a phase velocity of 1120 uh, meters per second, but the ratio that we got from using the Benioff relationship said the velocity should be 1180 meters per second. Uh, again, I think the, this result, while it's very good, uh, is a little bit uh, fortuitous given the difference in ground coupling between uh, the two types of uh, sensors. But, uh, and a lot more needs to be done to try to calibrate how DAS measures strain relative to geophones. Obviously, the ground coupling is important, but also the cable construction is an important factor. So uh, DAS is measuring uh, the strain in the glass, which is surrounded by cladding, which is surrounded by various kinds of jacket, and then that may be inside conduit. And when you add all that together, uh, there's going to be a sensory response that's not just that of uh, silica uh, cemented to cable. Herb, can we begin to wrap? We're kind of running short on time, unfortunately. All right. So I said I might not get to my last example, uh, which was in a mine, but that's all right. And I, I, I'll just skip to a summary that DAS is spatially uh, dense, large end seismic array. Uh, it can be used for uh, geotechnical work, earthquake seismology, traffic monitoring, infrastructure monitoring, uh, intrusion detection, mine monitoring. Uh, it needs to be coupled to the ground, but one can imagine uh, including it in infrastructure construction like roads and pipelines, uh, which is obviously um, much less expensive way to install it than uh, purposely, but also as many people are now demonstrating, it can be used on dark fiber. So thank you very much. Thank you, Herb. Dante? Dr. Wang, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, we have a few questions here, and I would like to be able to, to start with those. Uh, let me. So, uh, Yuri Istarovyot, I apologize, Yuri, for mispronouncing your name. Uh, but he's asking, what is the accuracy or capability of phase retrieval in radians of degrees by dust when, they, when we measure strain or strain rates? What is the possibility for what? What, what is the accuracy or capabilities oh. of phase retrieval? The accuracy for? Phase retrieval, phase measurement. How sensitive is to phase measurement? So, the, the I'm not sure what the question refers to in terms of phase of what. I guess uh, the response from the the um, the scatterers. Okay, so the primary measurement is by interferometry in terms of the phase of the return backscattered light relative to the outgoing phase. And then that phase uh, in radians is converted to the length change that occurred over the 10 meter gauge length. So uh, what is the, um, the, the percent error, uh, that's a photonics question, but in our applications, the coupling effects and the cable construction, I think, lead to far greater uh, changes in what the phase in the ground is than any um, uncertainty in how to convert the phase in terms of a, uh, the change in cable length and the change in the index of refraction. There's some uncertainty there, but uh, I would say that's only a few percent. Uh, Elizabeth Klein 
ask another different question related to the coupling of dust in, in ice. So she's asking, how well is the coupling impacted on ice without boreal or time to freeze in? She works on glaciers and ice sheets, and she wants to know if she can drag and drop the cable and still expect freezable data. I guess you want to go back to the mining results. But yes, yes. Oh, gee. <laughs> We actually did a little example of that, if I could uh, slip this in here. So our, our, if, if you look at uh, this DAS cable uh, installation picture, uh, we used a pavement saw and uh, cut a groove that was a few inches deep and about a half a centimeter wide. And we laid in three uh, layers of cable. The first one we cemented into the base and then the second one we just laid on top of the cemented one and packed it in with some loose rock dust and the third one we just lay loose on top and these are the uh this is the trace of all three cables and you can see a first arrival coming from a mine blast uh that produces a signal uh, even for the cable that is just loose on the floor. However, I will say that if you look in detail at each of these individual traces, the uh, first arrival is much, much sharper for the cemented cable than it is for the loose cable. Uh, Yuri has an, uh, another question and that is related to the resolution capabilities of dust. And he's asking why would be the capability of dust relative to the Earth's new low noise model. It's a, I guess a model by Peterson in USGS. I am not familiar with the model, so I cannot help you out with that, Dr. Mark. Yeah, I, I'm not familiar with that model either, so I, mm -hmm. sorry, I can't. I, I, can't. I would guess that that would de depends on the, on the frequency context of this, uh, the signal that you are capturing in the, for our studies that we did in DAS in, in, in Bradys, it was between uh, two to about 20 hertz. And the resolution will be determined by the phase velocity as well that is measuring, but it was in the order of the 200 to 250 meters per second. I'm not sure what the Earth's new low uh, noise models present. Um, then uh, Charlotte asked a question related to the vibro size on Bradys, Dr. Wang. She wants to know is the, did you generate only P waves or also P and shear waves? No, uh, the, the vibrator operated in, in several different modes. So I think it did the vertical thumping and then it also did the, uh, produced a, a, a shear um, source. But actually very little has been done with all of the multiple uh, sources uh, from the Brady's experiment. We have a question, that's a time for a couple of more questions. So Hilary Chang asked uh, for borehole application, how good, cap how good coupling is it if the cable just hang in the borehole? So uh, at Brady's, we uh, just had a cable hanging in the water and we did receive uh, signals. I think the, the, the signals though aren't uh, because the cable is, uh, uh, the, the, the seismic signal is being propagated through the water to the cable. What's the, the coupling is that there's a built-in helical wind to the cable. And when the cable is in the uh, borehole, it'll just act like a spring and couple itself to the cable. Now, maybe you can hang weights uh, and uh, assure that the cable is hanging directly in the borehole, but I think you'll get better coupling uh, from the cable pressing up against the borehole. And then, then you have to somehow account for the depth based on the difference in distance of, of a helically uh, spiraling cable over one that's hanging vertically. Mm -hmm. 
So uh, we have a couple of other questions. Uh, Chaoi one is uh, asking about what is the physical form of the collected data? Is it voltage? How is the data segmented based on the location of the virtual channels or by the gauge length? Okay, the first question is, uh, we uh, obtain the data from Selixa in SegWi format. Uh, so the, the data are in radians, uh, and so they need to be converted into a, um, a strain rate. Uh, but the physical so, measurement, uh, the physical measurement is light, being refracted back from the from the scatters, isn't it? Yes. Well, it's it's uh, the, the length change in a ten meter segment of cable. So when you take the length change and divide by that ten meters, you get the strain uh, between outgoing pulses the one millisecond so that's why it's a strain rate so uh, then, yes sorry I, I was waiting for the I, I need the second half of the question again oh okay so how is the data segmented is it based on the location of the virtual channel or by the gauge length okay so when you get the data you get it uh in the segway format in files that are 30 seconds long and this is just specific to the Selexa data uh, and so uh, the there's a time mm -hmm. sample every millisecond so in the 30 seconds there are 30,000 rows and then uh, along the uh, horizontal axis in this array there is a uh, phase every for every channel that's being spatially sampled and so our spatial sampling was at uh, one meter. And so over 8,700 meters, there are some 8,700 channels. So Dr. Wang, thank you so much. There are a couple of more questions, but we won't have time for them. Amir and Adam, we are going to answer those questions uh, offline. Uh, we really appreciate for all the questions. And Dr. Wang, thank you very much for a very interesting presentation.